Okay, so if we want to avoid word clouds, um, those are kind of a bad thing we don't ever want to use. Um, what can we use instead? Um, at the end of the last uh, section, I mentioned that you can use bar charts. You can use any of the other things that we've been talking about throughout the course of the semester. Um, but you can also use specific tools that were invented for computational linguistics, which is the analysis of language using computers. Um, and there are some core concepts and techniques that we can talk about. We're going to briefly um, discuss here and give an overview of these things, um, which are different ways, again, of basically visualizing counts of words. Um, again, this is like the, the word cloud for grown-up principle here. We can do cool things with, with text without just throwing it into a word cloud. Um, and so what we need to talk about are some of these core concepts in computational linguistics. Um, we're first going to talk about what tokens and lemmas and parts of speech are. Parts of speech you may recognize um, from your English classes in high school. Those are like nouns and verbs and adjectives. Um, we can actually use fancy algorithms to take text and have it categorize all of the words in the text as a noun or as an adjective or as a pronoun. And it'll try to guess using fancy statistical techniques and machine learning and Bayesian statistics and all sorts of fancy algorithms. Um, it will try to identify the parts of speech for everything, which is cool because then you can filter out all of the verbs and only keep um, like active verbs or past tense verbs. Um, that's how you did. That's how Julia could do the he said, she said thing. Um, you can find just proper names, um, just proper nouns. You can find all of the adverbs and see kind of the description of how people are acting in, in a book, for instance, or in different historical archives. Um, tokens and lemmas, I'll show you what those are in just a minute. Those are other units that you can work with um, with this text-based data. Um, you can also do something called sentiment analysis, and I'll show an example of that. Um, you can use something called the TFIDF um, value, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency Value. And really, it's a, it's a weird acronym. It really just stands for how unique a word is in the document that it lives in. So if you have a bunch of documents, a bunch of historical documents or a whole bunch of books by the same author, and you want to find the words that are most unique to that specific document um, compared to all of the other documents, that's what this TFIDF score measures. And so um, um, you can use it to, like if, you, if you're trying to do historical research and you know that certain documents were written by specific people, um, you can actually try to identify an unknown document based on the terms that it's using. Um, and you can almost like fingerprint um, the text that is in there. Um, and so this, this can be used as a form of fingerprinting, essentially. Um, you can also do something called topic modeling, um, where you basically use cluster analysis, which is a thing from statistics, where you can do like principal component analysis, where you just throw a whole bunch of numbers together, and it tries to figure out the best clusters of numbers. Um, but you do that with text. And so what it tries to do is it finds the sets of words that generally hang together. And it doesn't actually tell you what the topics are. It just gives you a big list of words that all kind of cluster around each other in the whole corpus of text, like all of the archives or all of the books or all of the survey responses. And so then you can look through the, the clusters of words and see what they kind of mean. Um, and then you can actually trace specific topics over time or within certain documents, and you can see what people are talking about related to those topics. It's a really cool approach. I'll show you an example of that. And then finally, there's this idea of fingerprinting, um, which I mentioned briefly with the TFIDF. But what this essentially lets you do is find unique characteristics of a text and then um, identify, like, you can try to identify authors this way. You can try to identify forgeries. Um, if there's one text that doesn't use the same sentence structure or uses much shorter sentences or uses rare words um, compared to all of the other words that the author uses, then the document might be a little suspect. Or you can try to, try to identify specifically who wrote it. Um, historically, people have used this just in the past 20 or so years. Um, to try to identify the authors of the Federalist Papers, um, which were a set of documents uh, written by John Jay and James Madison and Alexander Hamilton um, in the late 
1700s, um, right before the U.S. Constitution was ratified. Um, they wrote a whole bunch of essays to argue for ratification of the Constitution. They wrote them under pen names so that they wouldn't get in trouble in case the Constitution didn't pass and didn't get ratified. Um, and so because they were all anonymous, we don't know specifically who wrote which. Um, but in the years after the Federalist Papers were published, um, some of them confessed to writing specific ones. And so James Madison said, like, oh, I wrote this one. And like others would say, like, oh, I wrote this one and this one. Um, and so based on that, what digital humanities people have been able to do is they can find all of James Madison's writings and figure out kind of the main patterns of sentence or patterns of verbs and sentence structure and other things. Um, and figure out like his fingerprint for writing. And then they can look at the Federalist Papers and find which ones are most close to, or are closest to his style of writing. And so you can identify the Madisonian um, Hamilton, or Madisonian Federalist Papers. You can find the Hamiltonian ones and you can find the ones by John Jay. And they've pretty much guessed which ones are which based on text fingerprinting, which is a really cool thing. And it's something you can actually do in R. Um, I'll show an example of it on the um, example page for today um, with some code. It won't be in the example video because it's a little bit more complicated, but it's a cool thing you can do. Um, and you can show it off to your friends and be like, I can fingerprint texts. Um, so let's cover, you know, if we go back up to this idea of tokens and lemmas, what are these things? So if we look at just regular text, this is text. This is the, the very beginning of book one of Harry Potter. Um, the chapter is named The Boy Who Lived, and then after that, it's just text. Okay, so this is not very tidy text. This is just a whole bunch of text in a file. Tidy text would have one row for every text element. And the elements can be lots of different things. Um, in this case, there's a row for each chapter. Um, and so here's chapter one and chapter two and chapter three, chapter five, he goes to Diagon Alley. Chapter six, he goes from platform nine and three quarters to Hogwarts. And so each of these rows here is a chapter, but it doesn't have to be divided that way. You can also have a row for every page or a row for every verse if you're doing poetry or things from like the Bible or the Quran um, or other things that have like verse divisions. Um, you can have it be divided by words and you can have a row for every word. And so once you have like a tidy text is essentially just a data set that has a row for every element of your text. And it depends on what level of, of division you want to look at. So this is, um, if you look at this data set here, this is a very long data set. It's one row for every word in Harry Potter book one. And essentially, every single one of these words here is what is called a token, um, which is just a single word that means something. Um, what you can do, I didn't do it in this example, but you can actually do something called stemming, where it will try to figure out the root of every word. So if you look here, it says the boy who lived. Um, lived is the past tense of to live. And so if you stem that word, what it would actually show here is instead of saying lived, it would say L-I-V. Because then that's the same word, just a different tense, as living and lives and live and other versions of the verb to, or to live. And so if you stem words, which is one of the options that you can use when you work with text in R, it will trim off all of the suffixes and it will try to choose kind of the root version of that word. That way when you count things, um, like if we put this in a word cloud that had lived and living and lives, we wouldn't get three different words. We'd get one word. It'd just be L-I-V. And so we just have to remember that that means live or living or lived. Um, but then that is kind of a better representation of the distribution of that word because it's the shortened core root version of that word. So this right here, um, this word column, is basically, these are the tokens. So every one of these is a token or a text element. It doesn't always have to be a single word. It doesn't have to be a stemmed version of that word. You can also tokenize text by multiple words. So right here we have something called a bigram, which means pair of words. Um, and so here we have the boy, and then we have boy who, and then we have who lived. 
and lived Mr. and Mr. N and Mrs. etc. So what it does is it goes through the entire Harry Potter text and it finds every pair of words starting with the first word and then it shifts that window around and so it's a really long data frame again. Um, but it shows every single pair. And the reason this is important is because sometimes you'll get words um, that always go together. And that reveals lots of things. Um, and so, like, over here, we might have Harry. It will be a big word or a, in our hypothetical word cloud because it's said often. And then Potter is going to be big, too, because Harry Potter is going to be said a lot. So rather than having two really big words, if we look at the bigrams and we sorted this by the count of the number of times it says the boy and Harry Potter and every single pair, um, the really common pairs would show up. And so what happens often with bigrams is you'll pick up names, um, you'll pick up um, specific verbs. So it might be like Harry cast a spell. And so they'll say like Harry cast or Ron cast or Hermione cast or something that is a very common action that the characters do. And so it, it just finds like you, you don't really work with the raw list of every single bigram. But if you group by bigram and then get the count of all of the bigrams, you'll find every instance, like the total number of instances where it says the boy. And maybe that'll be like six. But then you'll also find every instance where it says Harry Potter together. And if you get the count of that, it's going to be like hundreds. And so then you can see the most common pairs of words. You don't have to just do bigrams. You can do trigrams. You can do quadrigrams. Um, they're called n-grams because you can choose whatever n you want. So this is technically a... a a n-gram of two, um, but you could also do an n-gram of three or whatever you want to do. And so all of these things are tokens. They're just units, smaller units of text that we're looking at um, as kind of the values that we care about. Um, some other core principles, there's this idea of stop words, which are words that are less important um, that often inflate counts um, of words. And this, this happens with uh, word clouds. Most of the word cloud generators have an option to remove common words. Um, if you don't remove common words like a uh and the um, and things like that, then when you visualize the count of all of your words, the most common word is going to be the or a. Uh. Um, and so what you can do is you can, once you get a giant list of all of your text here, um, you can remove all of the words that are in the stop words list. And when you load tidy text, there's actually a data set that it comes with called stop underscore words that has this list of a thousand plus very common words and you can just get rid of those. So if we remove the stop words from here, we would get rid of the and we would get rid of and and then like we wouldn't be counting those anymore, which is a good thing to do. Um, so once you tokenize your text and create the tokens, whether or not you stem it to get rid of the suffixes and prefixes, um, generally the first step is to count them and plot the words. So here is the, here are the nine, I think, what did I do? One, two, three, four, five, six. yeah, the nine most common words in each of the Harry Potter books. So all seven of the books. And then I have it sorted by, um, frequency starting at the top. So the most common word in every single Harry Potter book, unsurprisingly, is Harry. Um, the second most common word in every single Harry Potter book is Hermione. Um, except in Goblet of Fire and Prisoner of Azkaban, or in also Chamber of Secrets, where Ron is actually number two. So they kind of switch. So if you've ever read Harry Potter, the three main characters that are kind of a gang and they all are really close friends are Harry and Hermione and Ron. And unsurprisingly, they are the most commonly used words in all of the books. But then you can also look at other um, words that appear. And so they're very common Harry potter -y words. Um, sometimes you get words that are specific to that book. So in Prisoner of Azkaban, one of the main characters is Professor Lupin. So he appears here, but he's not in any of the other books. Um, Professor Umbridge in Order of the Phoenix. She's only in book five in a prominent position there. Professor Slughorn is in Half-Blood Prince. He's prominent only there. They all appear here, but they're not super prominent. Wand is important in Deathly Hallows because they're trying to find a specific wand. Um, that's one of the main plot points there. And so you can kind of see trends just looking at the frequency of words here, which is cool. Um, these are single words. We can also look at bigrams and see what the most common pairs of words are. And here we can see that um, most common words are 
the most common pairs of words are pretty much always names. So we have Professor McGonagall, that always goes together. Um, um, invisibility cloak is not a name, but that will often go together when it talks about the invisibility cloak. Um, sometimes you get things like Harry looked, and so that's a fairly common thing that appears is Harry looked at something. Um, if you look, you can also see different plot points. And so you can see the Elder Wand and Godric's Hollow, which are important um, plot points in the Deathly Hallows. The Death Eaters are an important pair in the Deathly Hallows. They're important bad guys. Um, and so you can see all sorts of like cool trends here just by counting words. And so rather than having a word cloud with lots of big and small words, we can actually start seeing trends here, which is cool. Um, we can do the same thing that Julia Silge did here and look at the um, ratios of he said and she said um, in the Harry Potter books. So this is across all seven books. Um, and so you can see which verbs are more likely to happen for women and which verbs are more likely to happen for men. So women are far more likely to scream and shriek and snap and bark and um, jerk and check while he is more likely to feel and wonder and realize and remember and recognize. And so here in the Hollywood scripts, um, he was more likely to like fight and destroy and kind of violent words. In this, none of these are really violent except like he growled, um, but everything else is kind of neutral. But if you look at the women in Harry Potter, they are screaming and shrieking and snapping, um, which is interesting. Part of that is because some of the villains are like, women. You have Professor Umbridge and you have Rita Skeeter, who's a, uh, who's a reporter. Um, you also have a character named Moaning Myrtle, who's a ghost who shrieks. Um, so she might be overinflating the shrieking um, that happens. Um, so there, like, there are other reasons for why these proportions are this way, but we can have a starting point for talking about that. We can see kind of the, the gender disparity in verbs in the Harry Potter series just by looking at this. We don't have to read all seven books and write down on a piece of paper every time he does something or she does something. Um, we can automate it. This takes like a second to run in R and it's really cool. Okay, so some other elements that you want to work with when you're dealing with text are parts of speech. And so this is similar to what you learned in your English classes. You can um, have verbs and pronouns and adverbs and things like that. Um, there are fancy algorithms that, that determine this for you. Um, and there's actually a project from the University of Pennsylvania called the Pen Part of Speech Tags. If you click on that link, it'll take you to um, a table where they have a uniform system of abbreviations for what parts of speech are. And so that's what you see here. This DET means it's a definite something. It's being um, cut off there. But it's, it's like the is, is that kind of part of speech. You also have a noun. You also have a pronoun. So who is a pronoun? Verb, live. Mr. is a proper name. Conjunction is and, another proper name. Dursley is a proper name. It actually finds the punctuation. Um, and it finds other pieces of the text here. And so this parts of speech um, processor, there's, a, there's one that you can use directly in R without installing anything extra. And I have the code for that on the example page for today. Um, it takes a long time. So like to do Little Women, which is one of the books that we work with on the example for today, it took about three minutes for it to go through and process all of the parts of speech in a single book. It took like 20 minutes for it to go through Harry Potter here and find all of the parts of speech. And so that was like very time consuming. If you ever do this, you don't want to put the whole parts of speech tagging in like an R markdown file, because then when you knit, you have to wait for 20 minutes for it to tag all of the parts of speech again. And then if you change anything and then knit again, you're going to have to wait another, another 20 minutes and that's miserable. So in that situation, you're going to want to put that in a separate R script, run it once, let it go do all of the tagging. And then in your R markdown file, you can load the tagged data um, and then start working with it. So you don't have to go through the tagging and that's miserable. Um, the nice thing about this package that does the parts of speech tagging is it can plug into other algorithms and other systems that handle tagging. Um, so there's a, there's a project called Spacey, S-P-A-C-Y, that I think is written in Python. Um, and it has, it, it does arguably a better job of identifying parts of speech than this built-in R1 here. 
and it might be faster, um, but you have to install Spacey on your computer separately through Python and make sure that it's working right in Python. And then you can connect R to it and send the text from R into Spacey, let it do its parts of speech tagging, and then bring it back into R. Um, and there's another um, system that uses Java, I think, that you can also have R connect to that, do the parts of speech tagging, and then send it back. Um, and I, there's examples of how to do that on the example page for today. Um, but what's really important here is like once you identify all of these things, um, you can filter. This is just a data set. So we can filter and group by and summarize. And so we can get a count of all of the pronouns. We can figure out the, the most common proper names in the book or in every chapter in the book or um, every 10 lines in the book. We can do all sorts of um, slicing and dicing and figure out kind of trends that we see. So if we look here, here are the most common verbs in Harry Potter, um, which are kind of boring, say and get and have, go, look. Um, we can see the most common nouns in Harry Potter. Not surprisingly, Harry is the most common noun, followed by Ron, and then Hagrid is actually the third most common proper name, in, or, prop, or noun in general. Time is the most common non-proper name, and then we have uncle. Um, and then if we look at adjectives and adverbs, probably not super helpful, but um, back, so, just, when, very, now, nothing really interesting there. Um, but we can, we can find stuff in there, which is cool. Um, as you saw, there was actually um, a column for punctuation. And so what some people have done is they have looked at text and removed all the punctuation and just looked at the punctuation patterns. Um, there's actually an artist um, that has a whole website of different books that he has taken uh, that he just looks at the punctuation. So here's Alice in Wonderland. Um, this is like an artsy version of visualizing the text in Alice in Wonderland, starting here, um, or starting on the outside. And so then these are all the commas and exclamation marks and um, question marks and periods and everything all the way up to the beginning of, or the end of um, Alice in Wonderland. He has a whole bunch of other books that do this. Um, you can do this on your own too. This is basically, if you open Illustrator, there's a way to draw a shape or a path, and then you can add text to follow that path. And so if you do parts of speech tagging and extract all of the punctuation, and then paste all of those punctuation marks together in one really long string, then you can copy that and paste it into Illustrator along this path, and you can make your own really cool um, artsy circle punctuation thing. Um, if you ever really wanted to do that, you can. Um, so those are some cool things you can do with parts of speech. You can also do something called sentiment analysis, where it tries to guess how positive and negative the text is based on the words being used. It's not always super accurate because, again, all you're doing is counting words, and it does not pick up on context. So there are different dictionaries that people have invented for um, communicating sentiment. So one common dictionary is this Bing dictionary, where all it does is it has this big list of words, almost 7,000 words, and every word is coded as either negative or positive. Um, and that's all. You just have two different sentiments. And lots of these are very negative words. You have like abnormal, abolish, abominable, abominate, stuff like that. Those are all negative words. But it's not picking up on any context. And so if somebody says like, oh, you're such an idiot, but in a joking way, then that is like a positive sentiment. Um, but idiot is going to be in there as negative. And so when you try to parse out um, the, the positive or negativeness of the text, it's going to mark idiot as negative and be a false positive there. So you don't want to do that um, necessarily, but it does kind of average out. You'll get lots of errors all over the place. Um, this is never going to be a super exact science um, because human language is very complex, um, but it does kind of show some sentiments, which is cool. There's also a built-in sentiment analysis um, system called using this AFIN dictionary, where instead of using just negative or positive, this binary value, it actually has a range. I think it goes from negative three to positive three that tries to measure how, how much negativity there is in a word and how much positivity there is in a word. And so you can, what you can actually do with this number is get the average value of negativity in a sentence or in a paragraph or in a book. Um, and based on based on this value here, it's not as complicated as the Bing dictionary, which only has six thousand rows. This has two thousand four hundred rows, 
Um, there's also a dictionary um, called the NRC dictionary that people have developed where instead of having values and instead of having just positive and negative, they have like six or seven or eight categories of emotions. Um, and some of them don't make like abandon that as a fearful sentiment. It can also be negative and it's also sadness. So they've coded that three different ways. Abacus is a trustful sentiment, I guess. I don't know why they put that in there. So if you ever talk about an abacus, that's, I guess, a way of communicating trust. Um, this document is a lot longer. That's like 14,000 um, different words with different sentiments attached to it, which is cool. Um, none of these are the best or the worst. They just get used in different circumstances to try to show sentiment over time. So an example of this with Harry Potter is we can actually plot the um, difference between the number of positive words and the number of negative words um, throughout the book. And so what I did here to make these plots is I chopped the book up into every hundred lines, I think, or it made them in 200 lines. Um, and so what it's doing is it's just looking at the first 200 lines and then counting how many of those words are positive and counting how many of those words were negative and then taking the difference. And so if there's more positive words in that chunk, um, you'll see it go up. And if there's more negative words in that chunk, you'll see it go down. And so that's what it's actually plotting here. And the cool thing is you can trace um, kind of the happiness and sadness of the book over time um, across all of these chunks. And so it starts off pretty negative in book one because he's at his aunt and uncle's house who are very mean and abusive. And then he discovers he's a wizard and he gets to do all sorts of fun things. And then school starts and it's sad. And then there's holidays and there's a troll and then there's more holidays and bad stuff. And so you can kind of follow all of the plot line here. And at the end where they're facing all of the difficult challenges, protecting the sorcerer's stone, it's all very negative. And then it ends happy. Um, so even though all of those words are pretty um, loosey goosey here, it's just like abacus is stressful, weird. Um, abnormal is negative, that makes sense. Some of these may be false positives or false negatives. It does do a pretty good job of picking up trends over time in these books here. You can also see like Prisoner of Azkaban ends on a very happy note. Um, Goblet of Fire does not because bad things happen there. Most of the other books end on very bad notes. Half-Blood Prince, very important character dies here and so look how sad that is. And then Deathly Hallows is a pretty dark book too. So really like the happiest Harry Potter book is going to be like Goblet of Fire, but only in some circumstances. I think this is the Quidditch World Cup right here where everybody's having fun. Um, so you can kind of identify plot lines just based on sentiment, which is really cool. And you'll have code for doing this on the example page so you can do your own and follow different plot lines um, using sentiment. And it's a really cool technique. Um, Another principle we can work with when we're dealing with um, text is this is kind of a more mathy thing. This is the term frequency inverse document frequency value, which measures how unique a word is in a document in relation to all of the other documents. So if we think of, in this case, a document as being like one of the Harry Potter books, and then the whole corpus is all of the Harry Potter books, what we're doing is we're looking at every single word in Harry Potter 1 and comparing that to its frequency in all of the other Harry Potter books. And if it's super rare to see in any of the other Harry Potter books and it's very common in book 1, that's going to have a high TF-IDF score. And that's what this math is doing here. You don't need to memorize this math. You don't need to know the math. But this is technically what it's doing. It's finding the proportion of the term over how many terms there are in the document figures out the log of the number of documents. So in the Harry Potter stuff, this would be seven documents divided by how many documents have that specific term. And then you multiply those two things together and that gets you the TF-IDF. And so what this looks like with the Harry Potter data is this. Um, it gives you an x-axis here that is pretty uninterpretable. It really doesn't mean anything to have this 0 0.001 because that is just the it's the product of the term frequency and the inverse document frequency, which are both inter uninterpretable numbers already. Um, so you can't really talk about like percentages or units or anything. So generally when people plot these things, they'll actually take the units off um, because they don't mean anything. Um, but what they like what you care about is the size of these things. So the bigger the TFIDF is, the more unique that term is in the whole in that document compared to the whole corpus. And that makes sense. So like one of the main characters in Chamber of Secrets, he only appears in book two here, is a guy named Gilderoy Lockhart. 
And so those two terms are kind of the most unique terms compared to all the other terms in the Harry Potter corpus that appear in Chamber of Secrets. So you can see that in other places too. Um, so dementors are very common in Prisoner of Azkaban, but pretty much nowhere else. Um, Quirrell, he's one of the main bad guys in book one. He only appears there. Um, and so you can see kind of the main trends um, of the most unique words in each of those books compared to the rest of the corpus. And that's like a cool way of, of visualizing different trends that you might see in the books um, or in documents or if you have historical documents or even survey responses. Um, if you survey five different states, for instance, you can have facet by state and you can see which terms are the most unique to the survey responses from state one versus state two versus state three. And you might see trends. Some respondents in state one might emphasize one specific term more than other states. So you can find all sorts of trends here using this TF-IDF. Um, another thing you can do is something called topic modeling. Um, and this is popular when you have tons and tons of text and you want to find in general kind of what that text is talking about and you can try to find some general patterns in it. And a good example of this, we're going to move away from the Harry Potter example for a minute, is this book here by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who is a historian at Harvard. She's the one who coined the, the phrase, um, well-behaved women seldom make history. Um, it actually came from this book here, um, where this is a very deep historical analysis of a midwife in the late 1700s because she left very extensive diaries. And so um, she goes back and recreates kind of the historical context for this midwife's life. And it's a really deep dive into um, late, seven, late 18th century life. Um, she got the Pulitzer Prize of, for this because of, um, of her very detailed writing. And so what digital humanities people have been doing since then, one of them have, has used the archives from this midwife, from Martha Ballard, um, and had them all digitized so he has the actual text for it. And then he fed it into an algorithm called latent Dirichlet allocation, which you don't need to know the details of. What it essentially does is it takes every single document and it uses fancy Bayesian math to figure out which terms are most likely to appear in individual documents. It tries to figure out a distribution of terms. Um, and so that's what you see here, like it's labeling, like Egypt is gonna be a specific category. Um, and so it's saying that this document has roughly this distribution of words, this document's gonna have roughly this distribution of words. And so what it does is you give it a number of topics to find. You say, figure out 10 topics or 20 topics. And it will go through every single document and try to guess the distribution of those topics based on the words that are in there. And it will figure out kind of a good way of clustering the most important words into 20 groups or 10 groups or whatever number of groups you feed it. Um, what you end up getting, so here's, a, here's some clusters from uh, Martha Ballard's um, diary here. You get a list of words. So if you look here, this, you have this column called topic words. Um, so you'll just get a whole bunch of words like birth, safe, mourn, received, called, left. Um, and so what you as the researcher has to do is look at this cluster of words and say, what is this probably about? And then you add this label. So what the researcher in this case did is they saw that labor appears, received a call appears, birth, a safe birth, all appears. That probably deals with her career as a midwife. And so any documents that have these kinds of words is probably going to be about midwifery. Um, she talks a lot about death um, because she was kind of an early doctor and was dealing with lots of um, maternal and infant mortality. And so words like death and expired and informed, um, those kinds of words kind of hang together and mean death. And so if the document or if this algorithm sees those types of words, it will label it as death. Um, she has or the researcher has categories for shopping, for illness, for gardening. Um, and so you can like beans and corn and planted and those types of things generally means she's talking about gardening. So with these clusters, once you identify good clusters and add the labels to them, you can actually track those topics over time. Um, and you'll have a new column called like topic or the proportion of topics in each document. So for instance, one of the topics that emerged is she liked to write about the weather and especially when the weather was cold. And so there was one of these columns that the researcher found called cold weather. And so what they did is they grouped by month for each of the journal entries 
and figured out how many of those months had an entry that mentioned cold weather. And if you look at it, it actually matches up. Most of the cold weather topics were in January and February and in November and December, which lines up with winter. So like, that's not like a groundbreaking finding, but it does show like this worked. It's picking up on her talking about cold weather and we can see that and it's actually happening. Um, another example is they, one of the topics was emotion and you can actually trace that over time. She becomes much more emotional over time because more of her family are dying, more of her patients are dying, life is becoming more difficult. Um, she's also expressing more emotion just in general about her life satisfaction and other things as she gets older and older and older. older. So you can see the, the changes in these topics over time, which is really cool. Um, so this is an example of distant reading. You're not reading every single word. You're not choosing one of her journal entries and writing a whole academic historical paper on just one entry. You're taking a giant step back and trying to look at broader trends across all of the um, entries in her diary. Um, another way you can do this, um, all of the State of the Union addresses since uh, George Washington are available online. You can download, download them as text and you can do topic modeling on those. And so one person has done this. Um, the link to this is on the in the presenter notes here. If you press P, you can see it. Um, and you can actually recreate the code to make this thing. But what they do is they say they wanted to find 20-ish topics in all of the State of the Union addresses and then plot which um, addresses use those topics over time. And you can actually see some trends. Um, in the early years of the country, there were lots of State of the Union addresses about banks uh, because there were debates about having a national bank. Um, lots of um, uh, speeches about the, the, uh, or the duties of citizens, um, other laws, so you have different acts that they're talking about. Um, but then over time, you start shifting. So around World War II, you start talking about expenditure and um, force and freedom and defense. And so here's the here's World War II and the Cold War. We we're talking about freedom, um, anti-communism, things like that. And then we start talking about energy policy. And then we start talking about family policy and school policy and um, uh, life sentiments and then family and business and the economy. So you can see shifts in what the State of the Union topics, the broader topics are just over time. Um, using this latent Dirichlet allocation topic modeling stuff, which is really cool. Okay, so the last thing I want to um, expose you to here is this idea of fingerprinting, where you can use specific characteristics of text to try to identify the author or identify trends that the author uses. So you can use punctuation patterns. So you can count how many commas are used in a sentence on average or the length of the sentence. Um, you can see what kind, what kind of words are used most often by the author. Um, you can also use this fun principle called the hapax legomenon, um, which is a Greek term, uh, Greek literary term. Um, if you took an English class or if you're an English major, you should know what this means. Um, a hapax legomenon is a word that is only used once by an author in any of the author's books ever. Um, and so like if you're if you have a prolific author like Sherlock Holmes or not Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, or if you have like a classic author like Dante or Boccaccio or like any author that has lots of text, um, you can actually find their hapexes, their hapex legomena and figure out which like it's a rare word. They've only used it once ever. It's never repeated anywhere else. And so that that's what this hapex thing is. And it's useful for fingerprinting. And I'll show you why in a minute here. Um, so if you look at this, there's an academic article where they used a whole bunch of different methods for trying to fingerprint text. Um, the link to it is in the presenter notes here. So here they're showing um, books by Jack London and books by Mark Twain. Um, each of these boxes is just a chunk of text. They took like every 100 lines or every 200 lines or something. And then they're figuring out the average sentence length in each of these books. And so with Jack London, most of his books have short sentences, except for one book, this Jerry of the Islands book. For whatever reason, he wrote it in a different style um, with much longer sentences. And then he switched back to short sentences. And so there's something unique about Jerry of the Islands here. And if I was an English major or an English professor who knew anything about Jack London, I've never read any of these books, um, this would be a good tip off of like, this one's different from all of the others. With Mark Twain, you can see similar patterns here. Most of his writing is very long, 
except at the end of A Connecticut Yankee, he starts getting really short. Don't know why. Um, all of his other books are pretty long sentences, except Tom Sawyer, which is written in a way like lots and lots of short sentences. And so there's something unique about Tom Sawyer that's different from all of, uh, all of Mark Twain's other books. And so you can kind of identify that strangeness or that uniqueness just based on the sentence length there. Um, the idea of the hapax legomena, where you have just one word that that author has ever used, and that's the only place they've ever used it, you can plot how often those hapaxes appear in a document. So if we look back at Mark Twain here, um, what we have is with most of his books, in most of his writing, he's using words. Um, there are lots of hapaxes where he'll use a word and it only appears once ever in all of his works in Innocence Abroad in this chunk or in this chunk. So he's, lots, he's using lots of new and unique words throughout, except in Huckleberry Finn, which has very, very few hapax legomena. He's not using any new words or any words that are rare to be used, um, which might be a sign that it's written at like a very easy to understand level. Um, he's not using um, uncommon words. He's using very, very, very common words throughout all of Huckleberry Finn. Tom Sawyer, surprisingly, um, the end of it is, is fairly easy. It's not using any new words that only appear once ever. Um, but the beginning is using lots of these, these hapaxes here. But if we compare back to sentence length, it's using really short sentences throughout. Huckleberry Finn's using kind of average. So just looking at this, we can kind of understand general trends within each of the documents based on this um, fingerprinting idea. The last example that they cover in their paper here is um, the King James version of the Bible. So they have each of these uh, Bible books divided up into little subplots. And then each of these boxes here are the chapters inside each of, of the books. And this is showing the verse length as a way of trying to fingerprint these things. And so in general, from Genesis up to like Esther in the Hebrew Bible, most of the verses are very, very long. Um, or generally long. But once you switch to Job, Psalms, and Proverbs, all of the verses get really, really short. Part of that is explained by like the genre of Psalms. Psalms are like really short poems. And so you're going to have like shorter sentences for Psalms. Proverbs are similar. They're like little nuggets of wisdom. So they're going to be shorter in length. So that makes sense. But then Job here is interesting because it has really short sentences, but it's not a collection of psalms and it's not a collection of proverbs and so what biblical scholars have done is they've looked at this and they said job was different from the rest of the bible it probably wasn't written by the same people who were writing these other books and so lots of research on job has found that it's most likely um from like persian sources or babylonian sources um and it's it's been transcribed into hebrew and put in the hebrew bible um as a separate thing and you can kind of see that just by this text fingerprinting here um, similarly, if you look at the, the New Testament here, you have average verse lengths throughout until you get to the book of Revelation where everything is really long um, because it's full of like obscure prophecies and it's a, a apocalyptic vision of the future and that's where we get like the 666 idea. Um, and so it's different from the rest of um, the New Testament. Um, which is completely different from the whole Hebrew Bible section. So just by looking at the length of verses, um, you can get all sorts of cool fingerprinting information from these documents. If you tried to do this with like word clouds, good luck. That's going to be impossible. Um, but you can do like really cool things moving beyond word clouds. Um, you can throw all sorts of cool statsy things if you just count things in different ways um, like this. So that's a quick crash course into computation linguistics. Um, there's no way we can cover this all. Um, this is mostly just kind of giving you a quick flavor of the things that you can do with this stuff. If you're interested, look at the Tidy Text Mining book. Um, it has lots of details about how to do this. The example page for today will have lots of code and examples of, of different ways of doing things like this. Um, in your exercise, really the only thing you're doing in your exercise is you're going to download a single book or multiple books if you want from Project Gutenberg and you're going to visualize it somehow whether it's a count of words or a count of bigrams or something, that's all you're doing there. If you want to go beyond and do some sentiment analysis or other stuff, you can. There's the code for that. But if you want to keep it simple and just get a word count, that's great too. Um, so you can do all sorts of cool stuff. And I would recommend 
exploring this further if you are interested in ever doing stuff with text.